Thanks, Emerson. So my name is Piet Heinz Strengold. I'm a senior cloud solution architect. And we also have Aspen. Hello, so my name is Aspen. I'm a principal architect in Microsoft. So uh, over the last couple of years, uh, we've had multiple engagements with uh, customers and helping them to implement data mesh. Uh, the questions I get, I get a lot of questions. And one of the questions I probably get the most is how to separate between the different platforms. So a key aspect is decentralization of the data ownership. And like Emerson just referred to the domain orientation. So Peter, uh, how do you see this? Uh, do you see any distribution of data between domains? Excellent question. Well, um, well, data mesh in itself is really about decentralization, making teams accountable for operating their data end-to-end -end and distributing data across. And when I talk to people, I learn they find domain-oriented data ownership the hardest part of data mesh. And I feel the difficulty here relies in domain-driven design. So data mesh refers to domain-driven design as a best practice or methodology to identify those different data domains. But um, as a methodology, it was originally, I think, um, conceived as a methodology for software engineering. So when you develop complex systems, so within those boundaries, it works really well. And I think it hasn't been a methodology developed for uh, modeling your enterprise data or identifying data domains in a larger, yeah, data architecture. So then the question is how to identify your data domains. And um, my recommendation, so first recommendation uh, would be is really to look at the scope and understand the different problem spaces you're trying to address. And I feel it's important to do this exercise first before jumping straight into the details of your technical implementation and your architecture. And this also aligns with domain-driven design because uh, there it says, well, you should set log logical boundaries um, around the problem spaces, because when doing so, the responsibilities are clear and will be better managed. So for grouping these different problem spaces, I um, encourage you and recommend you to look at your business architecture. And within business architecture, there are business capabilities and abilities. These are abilities to achieve a specific business purpose or objective or outcome. And such an abstraction packs data, processes, organization, and technology together within a particular context and aligns this to your strategic business goals and objectives. And what you see here on the screen is such a decomposition. So we created a uh, fictitious um, company called Tailwind Traders. And the overview you see here is called a business capability map. And this company needs to master all of these um, yeah, business capabilities in order to be successful. So for example, you see here a business capability called online ticket management. And you could imagine so without selling any tickets to your customers, you cannot do properly your business. And what you... Um, probably also will observe in practice is that most of your people are also organized around these business capabilities. And those people also typically share the same language. So they use the same vocabulary. And the same holds also typically for the applications you will see um, behind such a business capability. So they, those are typically well aligned and also typically also tightly connected uh, based on the cohesion and the activities they need to support. So therefore, coming back so to how to identify your data domains, I feel business capability mapping is a great starting point for identifying your data domains. Yes, you, you talk about the business capabilities, but data mesh refers to bounded context. Would you say that that's the same as the business capability? Not exactly. So excellent question. Well, business capabilities and bounded context aren't exactly the same, but they are strongly related. So business capability is a bit more abstract. So um, you could either implement them once or multiple times. And when you start implementing, you will yeah, see the, the, the solution space and bounded context. There are four setting boundaries on such a solution, uh, solution space. So the design of your systems and application and data. So it, things become much more concrete. And it's also the area where the alignment of focus of the solution space makes sense. And typically also you see, like I said before, you see high cohesion and strong alignment also in such a space. And to better manage your enterprise architecture, I would recommend uh, to think of aligning your business capabilities and your domains and your bounded contacts. This is no hard rule, but just a recommendation for you. Got it. Understood. Okay. Can we look at what this would look like in practice? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
So let me show the screen here. So what you see here on the screen are yeah, different domains and also the collaboration to, between those. So on the left, so let me use my pointer, here you see source system aligned domains. So you see transactional operational applications where data is created within, managed for the purpose of these yeah, operational use cases. What you also see here is a data product service. So these are services um, needed for yeah, taking the data out of these complex systems and turning the data into a data product. And then on the right-hand side, you see a consuming aligned domain, so another domain. This domain consumes data from other domains, combines, integrates it, transforms it for their own analytical use case, for example. But such a domain could also create new data and share that data again across to other domains. So in that respect, a data uh, consumer can also become a data producer. So uh, does that mean that you use the products as a way of removing the dependencies between the domains? Absolutely, so spot on. So this is where these data products, they, they play a vital role uh, in that part. So when performing cross-domain boundary integration or data distribution across domains, it's important to decouple your inner architecture from all of your different data consumers for flexibility and um, agility. And the best way of doing this is by taking your data uh, out of your transactional um, and uh, operational applications and turning that into a data product and providing this data product to other different data domains. I see. So uh, in, in each one of these, I see you have data product services. Would you please explain those? Yeah, those uh, services are yeah, really needed to create such a data product. And in Azure context, well, you could uh, see this, for example, as a resource group with a bunch of pre-configured services. And this typically also comes from a template like um, Emerson referred to in the beginning. He said, well, we need to make this template uh, based uh, in order to excel and accelerate. And so this is where these data product services are for. And in, also in a way, this is where cloud scale analytics is also for. Great, so maybe let's switch roles and I would like to ask you some questions, uh, Aspen. So Mike, Please do. in his story, he, he introduced these different data management landing zones for the data management layer and these different data landing zones for the layer of turning data into value and creating data products. So how would you see the mapping between those and these different domains and the discussion we had so far? Yes, uh, thank you. So when creating a subscription in Azure, there there are certain things that need to be true to ensure that your environment is secure, reliable, and scalable. Like uh, as a as a company, you want to ensure that your teams are self serviced. Uh, you want to do that, but you want you cannot compromise on security. So uh, to do that requires you to have a set, a composition of a set of services actually across networking, across what do we call Azure policies and authentication among others. So together, all of these things, we put them together and we call that a landing zone like Mike uh, initially introduced. So I, I love the analogy that he was using uh, of, of building a house because like you, you expect certain things to be in place. You expect certain things to already be there provided Provided to you by the, for instance, the municipal, like you expect water, electricity, a sewage system, and so on. And it's the same thing when you are building a landing zone. Like the data engineers, or let's say you have the data scientists, they want to focus on doing what they do best. They want to create those data products that you just talked about. And the company, they want on their side of things, they want to prohibit uh, unintended data exfiltration or publicly exposing endpoints. And they want to allow the creation of value from the data that they have in the data lake and avoid it turning into a data swamp. So using these capabilities provisioned as part of the landing zones, we ensure that the developers, they are free to build the products, but without compromising on any of the company's policies, whether that should be security or other. So uh, there, there's another saying that I like, uh, and it is they use the right tool for the right job. 
And that means going back to those teams, like sometimes when they build a product, they want to use a Spark pool. Uh, Emerson introduced uh, Synapse. Synapse has a lot of different options. So sometimes the Spark pool is the right, the right tool to create, let's say, aggregations of 100 of different files. And sometimes it's that uh, ADX cluster where you have millions of time series records that you want to uh, create analytics on top of. So like these different uh, tools uh, goes into each end of the different products. And each of the different teams want to be able to select the, the tool that is right for them for that specific job. Uh, Mike and I, both Mike actually and Emerson also talked about uh, polygon storage. And it's the same thing when it comes to storage. Sometimes uh, using, or it's always actually when using the right uh, storage technology for the specific type of job. So sometimes that means having a data product with a, a columnar store. Sometimes that means a data lake. And each data product might have different requirements uh, for both how they are serving the data and how they're consuming the data. Thanks. Um, maybe a question in that respect. So why can't you, I see two layers. Why can't you merge mm -hmm. the data management lending zone and the data lending zone? Uh, sure, you can. Uh, but my boss has a good uh, saying. And even though you can, doesn't mean you should. So we expect different people or different teams to be responsible for these two landing zones. And they have very different functions and very different purposes. So the data management landing zone is a single central entity to govern across all the different domains and all the different data products. And then you need to, or you want to separate the privileges between the people that I'm, or the team that are managing them and the people that are creating or operating the data products. So there is a, definitely a lot of different reasons for why we recommend. And there will always be like at least one of the data management and n number of the data landing zones. And another thing that's important to mention is that you lose out of the, the scalability if you decide to put everything into one subscription. Makes sense, perfectly. So let's move over to another pattern. Um, here you see now on the screen different uh, data landing zones. So could, could you explain yeah, why is this and when to use such a pattern? Is this for technical separ separation, for example? Yeah, uh, absolutely, uh, spot on. And, and this is absolutely my preferred pattern uh, or the recommended pattern because there are a lot of things that you should take into consideration when you put uh, when you design the architecture. So uh, our, uh, the key is to use so what we like to refer to as subscription democratization and to use the subscription as the method to enable that scaling. So uh, you look at different aspects. Uh, one could be data sovereignty. Like there could be, uh, we have different regulations in Europe. We have GDPR. Uh, in US, you have things like California Consumer Privacy Act. And I'm sure there's, there's lots of different ones like this that has a requirement from a regulatory, regulatory perspective. Sorry, not native English that the data has to reside in either a specific region or in a specific country. So things like that. Uh, networking is another uh, important aspect, like a uh, data landing zone, when you provision that, it's provisioned with a virtual network, and that gives you a VNet. And those VNets are regionally bound. So every new region implies a new VNet and that in the new landing zone, and then you need to ensure to have those peered to uh, have cross communication between those different domains. Uh, when cross communication between domains brings up another one, which is latency. So two aspects of that, or at least two aspects of that, I, I look towards the different domains that are collaborating a lot, especially when it comes to large amounts of data. Because as you know, if you take a large amounts of data uh, across two different regions with some distance between, that will add latency. So that's something that you want to avoid. Also look at the latency when it comes to the compute side of things or the end user side of things, because the uh, you might have applications that are super chatty uh, and super chatty applications require or is recommended to have in close proximity to the data. 
uh, actually, and all kinds of compute, what you want to uh, work towards is reduce the uh, distance between the compute and the storage of that data. And that's especially true when it comes to chatty applications. Uh, so that's an important aspect. Uh, other things that are important to take into consideration, cost, I uh, Mike briefly mentioned cost. It's a very clean cut for allocating cost. It, it's not the only way. Like you can use things like tags. So each resource uh, in Azure can be tagged uh, and thereby use that to allocate cost. But the cleanest and easiest way to allocate cost, let's say it's internally between different departments, is using a subscription. Uh, then other aspects is uh, security. So some deployments or some configurations specifically around some specific services have a requirement for elevated privileges, maybe to do operations on some of these services. And what you want to ensure then is that when you give someone those elevated privileges for that specific use case, you want to limit the scope. So their scope is only in the domain that they are already uh, that they are working. So you don't want to give someone elevated privileges across multiple domains unless it is actually intended and that's what you want to do. Then there is a, another one that's maybe not so important, but that's when it comes to limits. Uh, so all subscriptions, there are some uh, services that are some limits that are tied to subscriptions. Some services has some limits. So it's good to have that or keep that in the back of your mind when you design the architecture as, as well to uh, yeah, think about those limits, know they're there uh, and design around them. So the, the best way to avoid hitting any of them is to you go with this first principle of subscription democratization and you'll never, it'll never be a problem. Thanks. So but what you, you just described to me are more technical concerns for separation. Uh, do you also see functional boundaries, which can be input for separating different domains? Certainly. Uh, and what we've seen, at least with uh, with customers, is that they differentiate also sometimes between what is source system aligned versus what's consumer aligned. So that means they take everything that comes from a source system and tie those things together and then look at what uh, the what what are the consumers of those uh, different uh, products, and then tie those things together. So that's another way of uh, doing it. Cool. And maybe then one last and maybe stupid question, but should yeah. all the company's data then be persisted inside such a single data lending zone? No, there is, it's not a stupid question at all. And there's no such thing as stupid questions. Uh, and actually, because uh, it's, it's a very important topic to, to keep in mind because data uh, never exists on its own. It's never a standalone island. Uh, there's no application without data. You can, you can say you have a stateless as you want. There's always something being persisted somewhere. Uh, and the same thing with data. There's, there's no use for data without an application. So these two things need to coexist always. Uh, and that's why it's so important to put the data architecture, uh, make that part of your enterprise architecture, take all the uh, application operations into consideration as well when you design your uh, data domains and when you design your data architecture. That's, that's absolutely critical. Thank you very much. This really helps. And uh, what we would like to do next is to give you a short demo how yeah, such a data mesh architecture would look like in practice. And for this, we will use uh, Microsoft Purview. So let me stop sharing the screen and move over to a real life demo. Yes, I hope by now everybody can see my screen. So what you see here is, uh, well, recently it was called Azure Purview, but the new name is now Microsoft Purview, but this is our unified data governance solution. So it it's, has a catalog, it has a data map for collecting all of the metadata. It does uh, scanning, profiling, classifications, end-to-end -end lineage, and so much more. So uh, when we yeah, use and look through the lens of data governance to data mesh. So how would that look like then in action? So here on the left-hand side, I click on, this is my data map. 
And this is a technical viewpoint now I use to look at all of my different systems and data assets. So you see the company name over here and those three different domains I referred to in the beginning. So online ticket management, partnership and communication, and customer services. It's, it's just a selection we made, but just for demonstration purposes uh, only. Next, you see behind or below such a domain of these different operational applications. But what we also see, so here one data product sits. So the uh, complex data has been taken out of this um, SQL Server application and it has been moved into what is now being called here a data product. So this is nice and really gives an overview of the different domains. If we move back and, for example, look at, uh, at the glossary and more on a business level, so look at the business metadata, how then would uh, things look like? So here you see um, all the glossary terms, so the business terms. And these are also grouped uh, by those different domains. So you see the same domain, so customer services, online ticket management, and again, partnership and communication. So when I expand any of these, you can click through. You see here the product. Huh? including a definition. And here we also learn and see, well, this business term um, also is linked to a data asset. So when we click uh, further down, you see yeah, what is the actual um, data asset then. So more on a technical level. If I move back and uh, would browse my assets again, and for example, would jump into online ticket management, we could scroll down here on the left-hand side and look at the classifications. And here in this respect, so for example, I created a custom classification called data product. So when I would select this one, I would see all the data products. And here again, I also see one, this, this one has been certified. So we at least know it's in a good shape. And when I click further and I see the details, I would have hoped <laughs> my uh, da request data access button would here again, so when refreshing, so uh, when I click uh, through and I see this data product, so I could even here click on this request access button and start um, yeah, asking so uh, for um, yeah, accessing this, this actual data product. So I could type in the reason why I would like to get access to this data product. And then uh, really a data uh, um, workflow will kick in and the data owner of this data product will receive a noti notification and he will see, well, this person then in that case, uh, so myself will uh, request access to this data product uh, then and uh, could approve the data access. And then really truly behind the scenes, um, really the data access management will also be changed. So you could even manage data access from Perview itself. So build out your true data marketplace in that respect. So this brings me to the end uh, also of my demo. And now I would like to hand it over to uh, Marvin and uh, Hamoud. Thank you.